Greetings Internet, welcome to Aaron Plays. This will be the second of my deep dive rules investigation of Ambush, the solitaire game from Victory Games. Now in the first video we covered the basics of the game, how to how the game overflows, how to squads generated, um, and other stuff from this actual rule book here. Um, it's a 27 page initial dive of the rules and we've covered the first nine but now we're going to go into detail about the operations phase there are two phases in the game one is operations and one is rounds rounds occurs once we have active germans on the map operations occurs before that and in between so if we manage to deal with the first lot of germans and there's no germans on the map we then go back into operations but let's explain that in detail and let's have a look at the map So for those of you who've been watching the actual um, mission, this is where I stopped the mission because we've just gone into, to, into rounds. So this is at the completions of the first effective operation and we now have an active German sitting in this building as spotted by this dude over here who crossed the crest line just to see what was on the opposite side. Maybe he shouldn't have done but I'd rather know than not know. So just as a quick reminder, this is the, first, the fire team of the squad, and this is the assault stroke, scout stroke, search team, whatever you want to call it. Um, but that's part of the mission. We are looking here at the rules of operations. So I, might, I won't be moving any of those dudes, but I might bring counters on the map if we need, if we need to. So beginning on page 10 of the rules and i've highlighted some of the sections there are the operations phase begins when you bring your guys on the map and as it says at the top as long as there are no active germans on the map you are in operations it's as, it's as simple as that the first stage of the game is you are in operations and the passage of time does not affect this of the mission you don't record how long it's taking you to go from a to b theoretically if you don't activate any germans you could traverse the complete map and no time within the mission that will have passed there are no movement point costs involved since movement is always one hex at a time so as you're moving your so i'm going to move gibson here let's move him to actually this location and all this seven standing. Let's have them standing actually in the crossroads there. Okay. So as I move him on the map, every hex I pause. And I do what this section says is a paragraph check. So whenever a soldier enters the hex, make a paragraph check by cross referencing the hex letter he's entered on here with what appears on this. Now, I'm not going to do that because I don't really want to know what that is in that hex, but you, you line up the the letter. So that was G987. So we'd look at G7, okay, and it tells me to look at a particular paragraph in that window. As I said, I'm not going to go and check that because I haven't got here yet. So I don't want to know that there is or is not something there. And once you've got that cross-reference, you then delve into... The paragraph book at uh, that reference okay so that's the next stage so what happens then okay if the slot reveals the word none there's no effect okay there is you just then continue on to the next hex and then check that hex if there is a paragraph number printed in black look it up in the book and do as it instructs and if a black paragraph reference is preceded by a citing reference, which is either S1, S2, all the way up through to S9. Okay, that's what the citings check here is. Don't fill this in at this point. 
you want to wait until you're instructed to fill it in. But it's a potential of something happening. Of, of something happening. Also, if that sighting number S1 through to has already occurred and that letter is circled, sorry, that number is circled, then you don't look at the paragraph as well. That means it's already happened in the past. You've already done it. Each paragraph will also direct you to, to read include statements or series of statements that you can carry out. Some will describe an occurrence in a narrative form. Some will just tell you, do this, this and that check. If you pass the check, go to this page. If you fail the check, go to this page and so on. So you follow the instructions. Most paragraphs are a series of conditional statements, which you must roll a die or make a choice or refer to the map in order to determine which part of the statement actually applies to your situation. So whatever your guy's doing, it might be he's moving and it'll say, if you're moving and say he's out of command, in command, go to this paragraph, out of command, go to that paragraph and so on. So you follow the instructions in the paragraph. You only make one check, no matter how many guys you move into that hex at the same time. So there's a perception check you usually take the dude who's got the highest perception. If there's um, any other check that might be required, again, you take only one dude and usually the best. There are also, as I've described in the previous video, there are three stances a soldier could be under. So if we just zoom a little bit under Gibson. There he is in all his glory. He's currently standing. When I move him, it's treated as if he's, because I can only move one hex, then check the paragraph, it's treated as if he's sort of running. He's moving as fast as he can. When he's crouched and I move him in, it's treated as if he's crawling there. And if he's got a prone counter on him, he can't move anyway. So those are the three stances. You've got standing, Crouching and prone. The stances itself will affect targeting, your movement and line of sight. Just as a, 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 a heads up, if you're crouching behind or prone behind a wall, and these are walls, that's a window. You can't see out the window if you're crouched and definitely not if you're prone. You need to be standing to be able to see out the window. That's a slight going ahead of where we actually are because we haven't got to the line of sight rules. But that's... So what kind of actions can you do during operations? Well, the first one is what we've just described is movement. And you need to determine when you move into hex what kind of stance you're in because as soon as you move into a hex and you read the paragraph of the hex, that's the stance you're in. You can't change your stance as soon as something happens, you change the stance before you move in. I'm off camera with the dude, there he is. So if I wanted to move into there and be in a crouch, I, cr I crouch before I move and then move in. Because if I move into that hex standing and I read the paragraph and something happens, he's standing until I can actually do something with him again. So I normally have to go through the paragraph. He'll tell me if there's an instance to say this. And let me just zoom out a bit. Let's say he was moving here and then this German became active. He just appears. I am standing. If I was in there, I was crouched and moving, I'd be crouching. So a bit of a harder target. If you move into a hex and there's other soldiers of your, your traps in there, it doesn't mean you don't read the paragraph. If you know it has the word none already in, and then and you know there's nothing there, then fair enough. You don't need to read the paragraph because you know it's none. And you don't need to do a check, especially if you've done a little side note, which I generally tend to do, say there's nothing in the hex. But if there is something in the hex and you've got other dudes in there and you move in, you must still do the paragraph check and refer to whatever page it tells you what you need to do. But only one paragraph check is done at a time. So if I've got two good dudes in a hex and I move another two dudes into that hex, I still only do one paragraph check. 
other thing you can do in operation is a stance change. So you can change between prone, standing for each each guy. You can pick up and exchange equipment. So a soldier that is crouching or standing up can pick up or put down any portable item. So this gives him, if he had a grenade, he can drop the grenade in the hex or his, his rifle. Or if there's another guy in the hex with him, he can transfer the actual weapon. You can drag an inactive soldier. So an inactive soldier, someone's like is incapacitated, is no longer able to join in the battle. You can drag them. And you might, I think in this particular scenario, if I've got any guys that are incapacitated, I needed to get them into these three hexes, which is the railway station. I can drag them. But again, this can, is in the operations. And if you drag a soldier for each inactive, so for each hex that you drag them through, you make a die roll. And on a zero, he dies. So dragging a soldier from wherever they are, it, yeah, is a bit risky. The one in 10%, one, 10 chance of him picking out. You can also prepare a weapon. Again, if he's standing or crouching, you could, if you had a machine gun that required to be set up, you can actually set up or you could prepare a bazooka and such forth. You can clear a jammed weapon. You roll on the jamming table, make a roll, see if it jams. If it, a B comes up, that weapon's broken. And captured Germans can only be moved in operations. Can you remember, if they're captured, they're no longer active. Therefore, you'd move into operations and then you can push the German along. You might be able to have to take them off the board or, or such forth or move them into the railway building. That's the activity you can do during operations. So during an operation, a paragraph check may yield a black three digit number preceded by a sighting reference such as S1, S2, etc. A sighting only occurs and is checked off your record, either put in that circle which I mentioned earlier, when you read a paragraph preceded by a sighting reference. So it'll help you have a little and I'll show you in the example and the rules. So that's the paragraph number. And that there, where it's got the little S2, that would mean that it's a successful sighting. And I would then put that circle around the number two. And then any other time I now see in the paragraph that comes up, it says S2, or sorry, in the actual, not in the paragraph, on this thing and it has S2 on it, I do not check it again because that sighting has already occurred. And that's how sightings work. And there's a maximum of nine sightings throughout the scenario or throughout the mission. I keep saying scenario is a mission. The next thing which can happen is conditions. All missions begin in condition one. And what the conditions refer to is how proactive or active is another way of looking at the Germans are going to react to whatever you do. They become more alert the higher the condition number. There might be more options of spotting or sighting on that paragraph the higher the condition number. But all missions do start at condition one. If any paragraph tells you to change your condition, you remove, first thing you will do is remove all the vent counters on the map. So aren't the, in this particular scenario we've been playing, we are still in condition one, hence why there's two event marks here. I haven't been instructed to remove them. What the event markers mean is that if I move a dude into here, it, I don't have to do a paragraph check. Okay. Then, so when the condition changes, that's the first thing I do is I remove all event markers from the map. Because under the next condition, condition two, something, I'd ha if I went back into that hex, I would have to check to see if something actually is 
in there again because what's under the card in here on the sort of upside down that's useful isn't it so if i remove this this is mission two advance on chazal condition one as soon as condition two comes up i turn that over and these references are all going to be different doing different things and in this particular mission there are six of these sides in the card make sure i put the right side back okay as the situation and, and that creates the narrative of the tale it will be producing different events and interesting little conundrums that you've got to go through so conditions that are skipped never occur so if uh, this chart tells me okay i'm on condition one and whatever happens tells me to go to condition four i put the four chart in and i would miss condition two and three those will never occur in the scenario in the mission <laughs> get there in the end when the condition changes pause and make paragraph checks for each hex occupied by active u.s soldiers so as soon as my condition changes, I would make a, par a paragraph check for each hex my guys are occupied with the new condition card. So the sequence is when I'm instructed to change or upgrade the condition, I will, with the first, first step, I will change the mission card displaying the new condition and change on my little chart on my squad sheet I would change to show what condition I'm at I should actually I suppose circle number one I change that to what condition it's told me to go to I then remove all the events and then I make those checks for each hex my dudes are in so uh, each hex occupied by active US soldiers do a paragraph check because now the condition has changed. And make the check in hex number order, lowest number first. Now that means to me, I will go, right, okay, so lowest number first, this will probably be this hex, then this hex, then this hex. Doesn't say anything about the letters. Ignore any events that come up and place an event marker if it says event. If there are any paragraph checks and that cause Germans to become active and, and commence rounds, that I will do. And if a condition changes during rounds rather than operations, there's a completely different procedure what needs to be done. We're just going through what happens at the present moment under operations. Also make a mental note of actual the activation level for the condition. Well, yeah, it says make a mental note. Well, on here, these are the activation numbers. And if it tells, and this is how Germans can be activated. It might say, do an activation check. And if we're in the condition two, let's do an activation check for the Germans. On a zero to, through to a three, eight, the German will be activated. Now, with this dude, this German, there was no activation check required because Gibson, all right, if we put him back in his correct location, he moved from here to here, spotted him, and it was an automatic activation. There was no need to check the activation number. Remember, this is the situation we're just about to go into rounds. Next, we have event checks. So if you move into a hex and it has the word event in the little window on that um, mission card you would do an event check and this says unique occurrences are triggered at random during play by making event checks when a paragraph check yields an event result roll two dice and check the mission card now this is rolling two dice and adding the two numbers so if i rolled that that would be looking at number seven if I rolled that, 
eight and two, that's, I'll be looking at number 10. And that's, again, looking on, on this card here, there is, right at the end of this chart, a little, oh, it's got RE. So you would put that on the number just rolled. So shifting that around. So we just rolled a 10. I put that under there and it tells me to go to, a, again, a paragraph number there. Two zeros is zero. Two nines are 18. So that is the variable zero to 18. And if it says none, there is no event. After reading and doing whatever the event says, you place an event marker in that hex to show that that won't happen again in that hex under this current condition level. Remembering if the condition changes, you remove event markers and new things could happen because the alert status has gone up. Some events might have a citing reference preceding them. Again, follow the normal citing rules. In other words, if that citing has already occurred, the event doesn't occur. Next up is perception checks. Remembering on our list here, so if we look at our Ambrose, our squad leader, he's got a perception of seven. Bell's got six, Cornwall's got five. The better the perception, the more chance they actually have of passing a perception check. And on the German cards, we have the same. He's got a perception of eight. Oh, is that not focusing? There it is. He's got a perception of eight. So he's very aware of what's going on around him. What does a perception check actually do? So you, to make a perception check, you roll one dice. If the result is equal to or less than the soldier's perception, the perception check succeeds. If the result is greater, it fails. And in the paragraph that's causing you to do the perception check, it will, it will tell you what happens if you fail the check and what happens if you pass the check. And that happened a couple of times when I had sighting pro issues, I say issues, around here, I had to do a perception check. And even this spotting here, I had to do a perception check and he passed the perception check. He then had to, sorry, first of all, he had to see the sighting check to see if he actually sighted anything. He did. He then made the perception check. He passed that, which enabled him to see that, which then moved us into rounds. It's also given me a slight advantage in the first round in that he saw him before he will see him. I will have advantage in the first round. Any modifier to the perception check, a positive modifier, increases the soldier's PC rating. It doesn't modify the dice, it modifies the rating. And that's making the PC check easier. A negative modifier reduces the soldier's PC rating, that's making the PC check harder. But regardless of any modifiers, a zero is always a success. And a nine is always a failure. When you move in a group of soldiers and it allows a PC check, you will use the guy who's got the best PC rating. Some PC checks occur only once and require that you place an event marker in the hex if your soldier fails the check. No paragraph checks are made for that hex for the duration of that condition because you placed an event marker. Other things could trigger a, a PC check, such as booby traps, minefields, a grenade toss. Also use US awareness checks during activation to see you guys that are aware of what's going on around them. They will need to do a PC check. The next thing is activation checks. We've already sort of briefly discussed this. So Germans enter play in one of two ways as a result of either an event or an activation check. They're called, when a paragraph calls upon them to do one, you make the activation check. 
If the result is equal to or less than the current activation level, as I showed you on that job, I'll just show you again, because this is given in the in the mission. So we were under condition one, so on a zero or one, and the die roll was rolled, the Germans would become active. Well, that dude became active without an activation check. That was because of what the paragraph said. So sometimes the paragraph paragraph will tell you to make an activation check. In this case, that German dude, he was active. If you had to make an activation check and it was not an ought to one in this condition level, no German would have been activated. Again, there could be modifiers and they modify the activation number, not the die roll. And again, zero is always a success. Nine is always a failure. And when a German is activated, as in this case, we commence rounds. And the last part on this is random determination. Many paragraphs and game processes will require you to make a choice at random. To do so, assign each of the possible choices an equal die roll range and roll a die. So if it says one of you know you can go one of three different directions you will go okay as best as you can one to three equals this four to six equals that seven to nine equals that and a zero you re-roll and that pretty much covers we're up to this page here we're just about to start activation rounds so we're just starting page 12 in the rules let me bring you back up well i hope that all kind of made sense um I, I filmed the operations phase earlier today and I got to the point where I activated that German soldier and I'm about to begin rounds and I thought that would be a nice convenient place to stop. I, just, I don't want the videos to be too long in each case and hence why I want to just cover these rules because that's as far as I've gone in this mission. The first rules deep dive was how to set up the mission and what all those bits of the rules meant about how you set up the map, what the map means and such forth. That's why that was in that. And that was what I'd set up the video. I shot the first operations phase. Hence why I'm doing this video describing the operations. The next video I've got to shoot is the, is the beginning of the activation, what well, will be the activation phase of a round. And I will go through that entire round in the next video unless it's getting really, really long because more and more Germans are activating and such forth. So that video might be broken up into different episodes. I don't know. I mean, I could take out that sniper on the first shot, bam, back in operations. He could shoot one of my guys, activating that shot, ringing out, activates another German, and activates another German, changes the condition level, and the rounds could keep going on and on and on and on. So I will have to break that up a bit. But I don't know that until I'm doing it. So I hope you can follow along. After I finish that, or maybe if it does go on too long, I might do shoot the activation rounds or action rounds, deep dive rules, and explain it in a bit more detail. As I said before, you're here. If you're here, you're here to learn the rules if you've got the game sitting on your shelf get it down and play it and hopefully what i've done here will explain it in a bit more detail if you haven't seen my previous mission which was mission one play that because then you'll be completely away following along with this and then setting up this one you're going to see what i reveal but if you go a different route i mean as you can see i've got my assault squad going on the southern edge of the map if you go north it will or could be a totally different game. Probably the guy that's in, in that that German will be there. But he might be not not there if you have a different sighting level. I don't know. So that's why these missions, the basic story is going to be the same. But different ways you approach it will cause different things to activate in the different sequences, which will cause different Germans to be in different places. So they are replayable, especially if you give it a little bit of a break between doing it once and doing it again. So if I go through all eight of these missions and I've got all the expansions for this and I'll go through them all and then start it again. I mean, I sometimes stand up and go to the door and can't remember what I've gone to the door for. So 
Will I remember in detail exactly what's on here in, a, in two or three years' time? Probably not. And even if it's not infinitely replayable, it's still fun. So get it down, get it out, follow what I've done, and play the game. Anyway, if you're here still, thank you for watching. Hit the like button if you can. It all helps the channel. Subscribe if you haven't done so and you enjoy what I do. Any comments, much appreciated. Until next time. Oh, and the notification bell. I also get to say about the notification bell because then whenever I drop a video, it goes bing and you know I've done another one. Or well, someone's done another one because obviously you subscribe to lots of people. You're probably getting lots of bings. But if you could, again, much appreciated. Until next time, have fun, enjoy your gaming. Bye, Internet.